Uh, this is Jack Dalcourt, and welcome to today's uh, uh, PLC. Uh, for those of you who uh, have participated in this before, you know there are two ways to uh, get involved with uh, asking questions. Uh, first is uh, the chat box, which you'll see on your screen, and you can type in anything at any time. And uh, Jim and I and Alex will be able to see what you have uh, typed in. And the other thing you can do is to raise your hand. So uh, why don't we all just run through the uh, experience of raising our hand. Uh, find the raise your hand button on the panel and go ahead and click it. Okay, uh, Jim, did you get to see people do their hand uh, clicking? Yeah, it looks like it's working. Uh, if anyone's having a problem, I'd say uh, chat to me or ask a question, and and I'll try to assist. But it looks like most people are um, able to do that. Great. Well, thank you, Jim. So uh, the genesis for today's topic began at the November uh, SACME meeting. You may remember that forum session, and that session pointed that we need to be able to succinctly explain the value of the CME enterprise to our administrative leaders, the C-suite, as if it were an elevator speech. So my mind wandered during the session to what I might want to say, but then I snapped back and put the topic out of my mind, and then boom. Shift forward a month or two. I was walking between buildings here on the uh, University of Utah campus when the hospital CEO suddenly came out of another building alone and all of a sudden he was walking right beside me. Approximately 150 feet ahead of us was the next building's door that we both were heading to. I had a one minute private audience with the CEO. Well, what, what should I say? Do I do the usual male uh, social icebreaker that is talk sports? No, because I have zero knowledge or interest in sports. Even if I could have come up with a first sentence about the Utah Utes, the next sentence would have exposed me as a total fraud. Besides, I did not want to blow a fortuitous opportunity that will probably not present itself again. So over the next hour, we're going to consider some desirable characteristics of an elevator talk. Uh, we'll get some pointers that are on the web. And then we're going to finish it off with our group together brainstorming what words or concepts that we all might use. And that's where the chat and raising hand function uh, will uh, come in. So an elevator speech is education. It's not promotion. So why do I say that? Well, if you go to that unvetted, uh, unvetted source of wisdom called Wikipedia over here on the left, uh, according to Wikipedia, an elevator speech is a short summary used to quickly and simply define a profession, product, service, organization, or event, and its value proposition. An elevator speech is not an advertisement, because an advertisement is a public notice intended to persuade or to promote. So if you look up different kinds of elevator speeches, such as if you Google the term elevator speech, you'll see those on landing a job, lining up investors, giving a sales speech. And they often start off with, who am I or what are we? But then they go on and talk about being targeted, succinct, aimed at opening the door. So what makes for a forgettable elevator speech versus a meaningful elevator speech? It's the value proposition. The value proposition is you must answer, so what? So, you know, consider here I am walking uh, across the uh, university next to this uh, hospital CEO. So maybe I should tell a bit about it myself. So should I start off with, hello, uh, I wanted you to know that when I graduated high school, I was, my class ranking was number nine. Well, you know, the CEO is going to say, so what? So the value proposition needs to answer the question, uh, so what? So I'm in a medical school, and the CEO is not my boss, but he's an influential and powerful ally, and he contributes dollars to our CME operation. 
Our chance meeting was at the time of the Ebola headlines and on the heels of the American Hospital Association's CME as a Strategic Resource monograph. I asked the CEO if he was aware of the AHA's email updates about Ebola and that our CME office was forwarding these on to our course directors. I asked him if he had seen the uh, AHA monograph on CME as a strategic resource. No to Ebola and no, he wasn't aware of the monograph. So I said a few words about it and offered to email it to him. By that time we were close to the building entrance where our paths would separate so I put together one sentence about how the CME office's expertise and connections can help him bring about changes in some of the problem areas that he identifies. He asked a couple questions about the CME operation. We said our goodbyes and when I got to the office I me emailed him the PDF. The U of U has the good fortune of the, AAM, the AHA monograph giving a shout out with a pull quote in the margins about our PI CME program. PI around here is a big deal. It's an initiative of our Dean Executive Vice President. So with my short email message, I pointed to the exact page of that shout out and said that the CEO is part of the AHA's recognition of his institution. My elevator speech was totally unplanned. I had been thinking about an elevator speech as my mind wandered during the roundtable forum at the November SACME meeting. My off-the-cuff elevator conversation was put together on the fly. And this is something you probably would have done in a, in a similar manner. So my strategy was I tried to meet the CEO at his vantage point. For a hospital administrator, the American Hospital Association brings credibility and common ground. I then did a needs assessment. I asked if he was familiar with the CME as a strategic resource monograph and it was a way that I could find a point of entry into the conversation. I wanted to make only two or three points about how the CME enterprise was already helping him and I was using Ebola as an example and how we could do even more. And I tried to close the deal by blowing our own horn using the AHA and then I did a follow-up email. So you can go to the web and you can find tips for writing elevator pitches. You'll see something like the 30-second elevator speech, seven steps to deliver your best elevator pitch, elevator uh, speech outline, the perfect elevator pitch. So here are some things from one called 10 tips for winning elevator pitch that I embellished on. So number one, start off strong to snag interest. Be interesting but authentic. Use plain language. Know your audience. Focus on what matters. And we're going to get to this in a minute. A message map can be helpful. Number six, keep it conversational. Think about your end goal. Make a connection. Think of this encounter as a verbal business card. Tell, don't sell and open the door to continuing conversation. So how do you focus on what matters and what's a message map? Let's go to this uh, YouTube video. I want to show you how to pitch anything in 15 seconds. And we're going to do so with the help of a great tool called a message map. A message map is the visual display of your story on one page. So for this exercise, you're going to need a notepad, a tablet computer, or a good old-fashioned whiteboard. And we're also going to use the example of a real company called Lush. Lush is a global soap store. I believe they're in about 45 countries. They make fantastic handmade fresh soap. Hot, ah, well, it smells great. I don't have any financial interest in this company, but I know their messaging really, really well. I've talked to the founders before, and in order to create a really good message map, you got to know the story. So let's start with step one, creating what I call a Twitter-friendly headline. The Twitter-friendly headline is the one overarching message that you're trying to communicate to your customer, the one thing you want people to know about your brand or your product. I've already taken the liberty of filling this out. Lush makes handmade soaps and cosmetics. So again, 
based on my understanding and my understanding of the message. I think that's the one thing they want you to know. Lush makes handmade soaps and cosmetics. If that's all you know, it tells you a lot. And it also fits well within a Twitter post of 140 characters. So keep it short. But now let's fill in the rest of the message map with three, or at most, four supporting points. So again, based on what I understand of the messaging so far, I would say fresh is very important to them. And we'll talk about that in a second. Fresh. The other sub point or supporting point I would make is environmentally, and I'll shorten it, environmentally friendly. And the third point is ethical campaigns. They support a lot of ethical campaigns globally and in their various communities where the locations are held. So Lush makes handmade soaps and cosmetics. There's three reinforcing points. They're fresh, they're environmentally friendly, and they support ethical campaigns. Now let's see how this would work out in the real world. I'm going to use a stopwatch for this. Let's assume, hypothetically, customer walks into a Lush store. A sales associate might say something like this. Hi, welcome to Lush. We make handmade soaps and cosmetics. Everything you see in the store is fresh, it's environmentally friendly, and part of the proceeds go to support ethical campaigns in our community. Take a look around, enjoy yourself. 15 seconds. In 15 seconds, I gave you the broad story. If that's all you know about Lush, this actually tells you quite a bit. But now let's go one step further. Let's extend the conversation somewhat, maybe to a 30-second pitch. You're going to have to support these points for a longer conversation. So under fresh, you might add just a couple of bullet points, like uh, manufactured daily, ship the next day. Under environmentally friendly, you can put something like unpackaged, so that the plastic doesn't end up in landfills. Or you might put ingredients not tested on animals. These sub points, the supporting points for each of your three key messages, need to be very specific. They need to be examples, data, statistics, or even stories. And other ethical campaigns, you might add one or two of the campaigns that the Lush brand supports, either globally or locally in communities. So there you go. Know, this is a message map. It is one of the most powerful tools in communication. It works each and every time, even for very complex products or concepts. I know because I've worked with leaders who have incredibly complex products to, to talk about or to sell. In fact, the more complex your product, the more you need the message map. Because you as a leader, you need to communicate the benefits of your product in a way that is simple, clear, and concise. The message map is your winning ticket. Okay, let me close this down. Okay. So let's go on to this uh, TED Talk. with the question that we all dread. The question, what do you do? It can stump and paralyze even the most successful business person. There's this notion, well, instinctively we want to answer the question with what we are. I am a teacher. I am a doctor. I am a stay-at-home mom. I am a contractor. The problem, though, is that salespeople feel like that ends quickly the conversation. It stops the conversation because of preconceived notions about what we are and what that means and what that does. So the trouble is that salespeople are encouraging us, especially those of us who sell a service or who solve complex problems for others, or those who lead a cause, they're telling us that we should have a prepared elevator speech, something where in, say, 30 to 45 seconds, we can recite what it is that we do and we can make a clear case for why somebody should be involved with us when we do it. 
The difficulty is that this is a great struggle. Have any of you tried to create your elevator speech? And if you have, you've learned that it's really hard to come up with something that sounds truly compelling. People that have an elevator speech, when we're asked, what do you do, we still stop and we say, oh man, we think in our head this internal dialogue, I hope I can relay this well, I hope that it's effective. If we don't have an elevator speech, we think when someone asks us what we do, we answer with what we are, and then we think, I really didn't use that opportunity very well to put myself out there and create a sense of what it is that I can do for that person. So we kind of kick ourselves a little bit afterwards. So what's supposed to happen when we use this elevator speech? Something really magical is supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is, say you're a teacher and someone asks you what you do. You're supposed to illustrate uh, or answer with something like, I change the world one child at a time. And the person is supposed to say, wow, that's so interesting. Please, please, tell me more. I'm dying to hear. And that really rarely ever happens. What usually happens, that's a noble cause, a noble purpose, teaching, right? When somebody smells that you might be working up to selling something, they're absolutely not going to want to invite a sales pitch. In fact, the reason that they ask you what you do is usually just out of politeness in the first place. Yet we persist in this notion that if we tell somebody something about what we do, that we can do it in a way that's really meaningful to them and that's welcome. And it's really not. You know what this actually is? This is actually in-person spam. It's not something that we invite. We're barraging people with our commercials. We're interrupting their day. We're giving them information that maybe in another situation could be of interest to them or of context, but we don't know yet. It's premature. We're delivering information in a way that is irrelevant to them. What the elevator pitch does, I believe, is it epitomizes what's wrong with marketing today, especially in the non-product world. What it does is it tries to emulate product marketing. Product marketing is all about features and benefits. It's all about saying what something can do for you to the mass market. Think about commercials, television commercials, and how they appeal to the mass market. In fact, they're so irrelevant to most people that what they seek to do is entertain you so that even if you don't need what it is that they're doing, hopefully the commercials will be memorable enough to you that you'll recall it later should that need ever arise. So when we do what we do in a way that solves complex problems for people, we need to really appeal to them through rapport. We need to earn their trust so that they'll listen to us and maybe take heed of our words and care enough about what we're going to say about how to help them. So where does this start? To be taken seriously, a record, uh, sorry, a rehearsed message is never going to get us there. In fact, unless we hobnob with famous people, or we do something that really is changing the world in a compelling way, no one is waiting with bated breath to hear more about what it is that we do. Just like, just like the flat answer of what we are ends the conversation abruptly, the preconceived notions will kick in at this point, and um, the stereotypes will kick in at this point, and people will shut down and say, you know, I don't need that, like the commercial, right? I don't need that. I already have it. That's good, I know what it is. And you'll get an answer that says something like, okay, that's nice, and the conversation halts. So the elevator speech is based on a string of events that start with you sitting in your office, back in your room, and creating, crafting this thing that's about you and about what you want to say to just about anyone, not to anyone specific. It's just to anyone in general. And the problem with this is that we need to really ditch the elevator speech and make the message more relevant to the individual that we're talking to. We need to invert this, and I'm going to show you how. First, we need to stop taking bad advice from sales gurus who tell us that we should emulate the product marketing world, because that's probably not what we do. We need to stop broadcasting impersonally, and face-to-face -face broadcasting is even worse. But this also applies to social media. If you're a social media user, you don't want to be broadcasting um, you know, blanketly to mass market uh, through social channels. That would put you in the same light as this. We need to be relating and we need to be connecting to people. We need to know and we need to think about what it is that we're actually trying to do in our careers 
and when we contact other new people, when you network after this event, what is it that you're trying to accomplish by meeting new people? You're trying to show them that you can help them. And you're trying to show them that you might have some answers and some ideas for them, for their complex problems. There's a really ancient art, ancient practices that take us back to a way to teach people and to enlighten them about new things, things that they didn't know. That ancient art, if you think back to it, is storytelling. Humans have always done really well with stories. Stories are these beautiful packages or containers that house nuances uh, and, and complicated messages. And they teach lessons and they illustrate revolts. And they bring us to solutions in a creative way. Stories that we hear and stories that we tell cast the light on who we are. They cast the light on our values and on our beliefs. They can show the nature of our character. They can show us where, um, if we're if, if we're funny or we're, we're you know, dull or dry, they can show if we're confident or if we're tentative. They can expose what we're most passionate about. But most importantly, above all, they humanize us. So by inverting the path that I showed you like before, by starting with the person that you're talking to, you can get to a point where you're crafting a really relevant message on the spot, right? You're crafting a really relevant message that meets their needs and answers their story. So we're going to seek to exchange stories with people instead of giving a strict, straight elevator pitch. And you might be thinking, how do we decide what stories to tell someone? It's not easy. If we're thinking about it in advance, we might have a couple of favorite stories about results that we can deliver or what have you. But we really need to think about what stories to tell you, this person, at this specific time. And that's quite a challenge. The key is to start with them. Who are they? So when someone asks you what you do, you want to turn the conversation around fairly quickly and find out more about what they do so that you can make your responses and your answers relevant to them. Each of us take a path in our life. We've each followed a journey to get us to where we are today. The journey has twists and turns and nuances. Most of us that started in our careers didn't start by doing what it is that we're doing today. And when you learn somebody else's journey and somebody else's path, it's laced with clues about who they are, and it gives you opportunities to see where your paths have intersect over the course of the years, so that when you talk to them, you have new associations. We're all used to using social connectors when we talk to people, when we meet someone new. Maybe it's, do we both have children? Are our children about the same age? Do we have grandchildren? Did we grow up in the same area? Do we follow the same sports team? We look naturally for social connectors because that's a nice, safe place to be. But what we're really talking about here is developing business or finding people to follow our cause. And so what we need to do is focus more on the business side, and we're looking for the business connectors. So I'm going to show you five questions that help you get people to share their business path with you so you can find ways to relate to them along the lines. I want you to think of marketing as a facilitated conversation where you're asking the right questions to invoke responses that are meaningful to the person and meaningful to you. Multifaceted. The first question to ask isn't what do you do, because we know that can be a little bit off-putting and a little intimidating because of what we've discussed. The best first, first question is, where do you work? You might get a geographical response to that, so you can dig a little bit deeper. But where do you work is a much more interesting question to ask, because people will then start to tell you a little bit about their company. The next question to ask is what inspired you to go into that? And if inspired feels a little touchy feeling, you can say, how did you end up doing what it is that you're doing? The next one that takes you to a very positive place, what do you like about what you do? And that one makes you think in a happy spot. And when people are happy, they associate that happiness with you. But what do you like most about what you do? The next question is, what is what, what, whatever it is that they do like when you started? What was that like when you started doing that? A reflective question is really powerful. And this is a complicated question because it's also a comparing question. When you get somebody to think back and compare what something was like then with how something is now, they're digging deeper. And when people dig deeper, journalists will tell you this, there's much more thought going on about, wow, this person's kind of inspiring. This person makes me think 
And I like that. People like to think, and they like to think that you're that interested in them. So this is a really powerful question. And lastly, how do you approach something about what you're doing now? We want to bring them back to the present. And often you can have heard in the first questions clues that will help you ask, how do you approach something now? And they'll unearth different complexities or problems or issues that they're dealing with. So that when you're talking back with them later with your story, you can be relevant to these issues. So focusing on not interjecting, really nodding and smiling and encouraging more answers is an important place to be in this conversation. Open-ended questions are also the best. Thoughtful follow-on questions are also excellent. But realize that after a certain point in time, you've asked so many questions that the person is going to probably realize, I've been talking too long. Maybe I should reciprocate. And that's great. That's what you want them to do. Because then they'll invite you to tell your stories. And if they don't invite you to tell your stories, you can still bridge the gap um, kind of the same way that you, that you would otherwise move the conversation along. And that would be by saying something like, I find it really interesting that you, and insert something common, a commonality between you there. And then you can follow that with, similarly, I have. Now you're not trying to one-up them here, so you don't want to throw something like that in there, but you're just trying to lead, to show where those paths have intersected over the years, to lead them down your path a little bit too. So by relating and tying your stories together, you're actually helping them a great deal to have the context to see how they relate to you in the past and in the future. And there's one other piece that's really important that I want to leave you with. When you help people, you have a different level of connection than you could ever have just by talking with them. So when you have this opportunity to interface with people, think about maybe two other ways that you could potentially help them. One is by introducing them to someone you know already, where there would be a mutually beneficial relationship, where the two people could get more out of working together or knowing each other than simply by knowing you. You're helping two people in that process, and you're deepening the relationship. So offer to introduce them to somebody and tell them why. I think you really should meet this person. That would be really good for both of you. Another way to help them is to offer to send them something, not something marketing or sales related, but something really informational and something related to a place that they've been in their past. By asking their permission to send them something, either something that you've read or something that you've written, you're getting their permission to stay connected. No elevator speech is going to take you to that level. So I want to leave you with this. What can we take away from the ancient ritual of storytelling? Stories are purposeful. Like elevator speeches, Stories are performances, in a way, but that's all that the two have in common. Storytellers grip us, and they invite us in. Their stories are always for us. Their stories are not for them. That's really important when you think about the life and life for me. They're, before they begin, the storyteller always understands their audience, and they begin to understand what their audience needs to hear. So effective marketing doesn't come from broadcasting. It comes from relating. Forget canned messages. Forget pitches. Just seek to connect through exchanging stories and find ways to stay connected. Thank you. So, Jim, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I wasn't sure because one of my screens wasn't, it, it changed. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. So, here's some... Uh, some advice that uh, we heard on that last TED Talk, and you also see it on uh, some of the uh, uh, internet suggestions. Number one, focus on them, not you. Target their needs. That means having multiple elevator talks for differing uh, C-suite roles, a different one for the CMO versus the CEO uh, versus the CFO. Uh, tell a story. Make them care. Be conversational. Leave them wanting more. 
close with a continuation, a call to action to do something, and promise to send something in follow-up. But I think we as CM educators already have the skills to craft our elevator conversation. We can transfer what we already know about designing CME. So focus on them, not you. Well, that really aligns with uh, essential C2, that is uh, uh, that uh, you design the education around uh, uh, the professional performance gaps in your own learners. And then C17 is utilizing non-educational strategies as an adjunct, that is, reminders. So we already know how to do many of these things. So let's go back to my story. Because I tried to meet the CEO at his vantage point, I took a stab at the hospital, or he is a member of the American Hospital Association. The CEO is under pressure to increase the value in our healthcare system. And that's probably true in your system as well. Value and quality improvement, that is the holy grail. I wanted to make only two or three points about how the CME enterprise was already helping him and how it could do more. Uh, I had a Twitter-friendly main message, that is, CME is a strategic resource that can help the CEO reach his institutional goals. My supporting point number one was, the American Hospital Association also says so. And my supporting point number two was, Ebola uh, exemplifies our ability for rapid cycle response, and we already have a network of connections to the professional staff. I tried to close the deal by making him care and want to know more about what the AHA had said in that uh, strategic resource monograph and what in particular they said about the University of Utah. Uh, and then I did a follow-up reminder about uh, from this encounter and sent him uh, reinforcement of our conversation by mail, by email. So now here's the point where uh, we can come together and as SACNI members figure out what is it that we have in common with, uh, our programs have in common with each other, and how can we use that to uh, craft our message. You know, whether we come from medical schools, teaching hospitals, specialty societies, to differing degrees, we all share missions of research, teaching, and patient care. And we're all buffeted by similar outside forces. So let's use this PLC's remaining time to come together, sort of as an expert working group, and brainstorm how we might be able to tell our CME story. It might be a little different uh, in terms of nuances at one institution compared to another, but I think there are going to be some common themes that we can communicate as our Twitter-friendly main messages. And there are probably some common supporting points that we can illustrate or build upon these main messages. So, so with that, uh, let's open it up to uh, conversation. Raise your hand or type something in the chat box and uh, let's brainstorm. So does anybody have an idea of what might be a Twitter-friendly main message that might apply to your organization? Not seeing any hands raised yet. Uh, here we go. Um, well, I've got uh, Julie White with her hand raised, but it looks like we have a 
you may not have put your audio pin in yet. Uh, if you're connected by uh, by telephone, you'll need to do um, uh, the pound key. I'll send that to you real quick. If anyone does, anyone else want to chime in while we wait? Uh, here we go. We've got um, Carol Goddard. Are you there, Carol? How about Jan Patterson? Patterson, hi. Hello. Can you hear us? This is from Dr. Patterson's group. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so we we just sent in the text box our main message, which is CME works with our providers to improve care. Okay, CME works with our providers to provide care. And we improve. To improve care. Yes. Okay, looks like I've got one from Maria Sullivan, dedicated to sponsoring medical education activities that enable physicians and other healthcare professionals to better treat, manage, and educate their patients. Let's see. I've got another one from Carol Goddard. Here's Carol's message. Um, is our core message geared internally to our institution C-suite or externally to all those at that level? So this is sort of the needs assessment. And uh, uh, so based on the one you're trying to talk to, uh, what is it going to be for them? So you can have uh, uh, an elevator pitch for anybody, and I was just focusing on what you might do uh, for the C-suite only because that was the thrust of the conversation at uh, that SACME session. It looks like one more additional comment here is from Ellen Seaback. Uh, physicians will be more engaged in required training if they get credit or at least less, resent less resentful. And here's one from Alex. Um, CME helps our institution go from where we are to where we need to be. In our words, close the gap. Okay, well, uh, why don't we just start with those, and what we can, what the next step would be uh, from that message map would be to come up with some uh, supporting points. So uh, uh, let me just start with uh, uh, Alex's one, which was uh, see me help our uh, institution go from where we are now to where we ought to be. That is, close the gap. So supporting points might be how to do that, like what gaps or uh, uh, something that amplifies on uh, uh, how CME helps our institution close the gap. Uh, does anybody have any ideas on what might be a supporting point that you could use if your main message was CME helps our institution uh, to close the gap? What would you p say, based on what your institution is, uh, for a supporting point. Jim, or, um, Jack, before we clarify, this is Alex. I'm just trying to uh, understand a, a little bit more. Um, 
one of the things that, that I see is, you know, this, we, we've had this discussion before at the national meetings. We have an image problem, right? And so um, when we, when people's concept of CME equals big hotel room, fancy dinner, coffee, and snacks in the back, and uh, one, one directional lecturing. Um, do we have to start the message, or one of the supporting points is that's not CME? What do you all think? Uh, we've got Julie White uh, hand raised now. Let's see if we can get her on this time. Julie, are you there? Can you hear yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear? Oh, good. Um, well, just thinking about what Alex was saying, I think that we are that still. I mean, I think that our producing meetings and you know, doing great things in live meeting context is still important. But I think what happens is, however people interface with us, that's they that they think that that's the only thing we do, and they don't realize all the other broad spectrum of what we do. So maybe it's something like you know, CME, way, way more than just a meeting or something to that effect. So CME, way, way more than just meeting planners. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that wasn't the most articulate, but, you know, CME way, you know, moves well beyond meetings and things to that effect. And so to Alex's point, uh, what do you think about the idea of uh, also saying like uh, uh, the advertising campaign, it's not your father's Oldsmobile, CME is now, is not your uh, uh, previous CME, what you think of uh, CME, uh, it's not uh, uh, about uh, uh, sweating pictures of water in a darkened room. I mean, to me, that's the that's the breaking down of the barriers. If if that's what people equate with what we are, then we have to demonstrate our value beyond that. That's not to say we don't do that, but it's we do that and a whole lot more. Um, and so, to use the the videos, you know, you have to describe the whole lot more in 15 seconds. So, what's the whole lot more? Do you take the approach of uh, you know, we, we are working with quality. Do you take the approach uh, we, we uh, are making, helping make patients' lives better? Uh, you know, you could take a lot of approaches. So there are some probably institutional initiatives that are going on at your own uh, facility. Perhaps uh, some of those you might uh, organize your your message around. Are there some some of these uh, uh, initiatives that uh, are happening at your institution? Maybe you'd like to tell us about that. Well, let me throw in one here from the University of Utah, and that's the exceptional patient experience. That's one of the initiatives that our hospital is trying uh, uh, to do. Maybe there are some things that uh, uh, are like that that your hospital is uh, trying to do to focus to uh, uh, bring the institution to a new place where it's at. And that would be something that uh, uh, the people in the C-suite are interested in. How can you help them get to their new place, like the exceptional patient experience?
This is just a reminder, everyone, this is a two-way street. Please comment. Jack is making excellent points here, and the, the point is to have a conversation, just like we just learned. So please continue the conversation. Okay, hey, we've got uh, Maria Sullivan. Um, you should be unmuted now. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So just thinking about what you said a few minutes ago on organizing our message around institutional initiatives. For instance, in a medical school like ours where the um, <clears throat> administration or the medical education is moving, <clears throat> excuse me, so much more towards the primary care delivery and for instance here at Brown University there's a new <clears throat> primary a population health primary care program being launched. We in this office have been working closely with faculty in faculty development programs and um, you know helping them to um, learn how to not only teach the students but also teaching preceptors and community providers how to teach the students when they go to their facilities. So I'm not sure how to just put that into, you know, like a 10 word statement. So uh, I heard Maria say that uh, one of their initiatives was uh, on uh, faculty development. That could be a main message and that supporting points were for developing uh, preceptors ability and then also developing community providers abilities. Is that, uh, is that fair, Maria? Yes, yes it is. So you could build, so right then and there, you probably have covered uh, at least 15 seconds of your uh, elevator talk. Are there any other uh, initiatives that your institutions are doing uh, in addition to uh, Maria's primary care? Okay, we've got uh, Dana Muir. Yes, hi. Um, we are currently working um, in, in concert with the Brigham and Women's Hospital on a patient safety and healthcare quality improvement uh, program, um, talking about issues relative to transitions in care, uh, challenges of improvement and change leadership, um, alarm fatigue and management, um, med medication reconciliation, a whole host of areas relative to um, patient safety and quality improvement, and also um, a good portion of this um, is going to be eligible for risk management study, which is, or risk management credits, which are um, part of a re the requirements for the Massachusetts, uh, for Massachusetts physicians as part of their relicensure. Fantastic. You've come up with uh, uh, main messages in terms of uh, uh, patient safety and quality uh, improvement, and then you had a bunch of supporting points. Uh, uh, you had uh, things like alarm uh, uh, manage, uh, alarm fatigue, and uh, medication reconciliation, and uh, you also talked about uh, relicensure. So right then and there, you have come up with main messages, several supporting points, and uh, uh, could very easily uh, uh, have some additional points in there. So uh, Dana, you have yourself uh, uh, your uh, uh, elevator message right then and there. Thanks, Jack. Anybody else have any initiatives that their hospital is doing? It looks like a couple of uh, comments came in online. Um, Dr. Salazar says, African-American hypertension disparity, patient safety, asthma management, our initiative at his institution. Uh, 
Alan Seaback has uh, they're addressing Q and S infection control EHR training ICD ten education. Does anybody want to raise their hand and speak about that? Okay, um, Ellen, I need you to put your pin in. Should be uh, pound nine seven. Meanwhile, I've got Julie uh, White. Go ahead. Hi, sorry. I was just going to say that we've been doing um, for like two, three years uh, education nationally on safe opioid prescribing, and so. I think it's important when we think about what all of us do to realize that you're helping promote your own medical school nationally with a lot of programs you're doing, and you may not be getting full credit for that, and you should be. And Ellen, looks like we got you online. Jack, this is Ellen. Can you hear me? I can, Ellen. Hello. Hello. How are you? Great. So what's up? So I have uh, with me Mark Langdorf, Dr. Langdorf. He's the Associate Dean for CME and Professional Development here, and I think he's going to make a comment about our quality and safety initiative. Yeah, so Ellen and I have been working uh, with uh, the uh, what they call UC Learning Office. The UC Learning Office responsible for all the computer-based training for the staff and the physicians. Um, and there's a proliferation of computer-based training uh, that we're all, all required to do, trying to get uh, in there to accredit it and uh, make it more valuable. In addition, the uh, ICD-10 coding training is changing the way we all code our charts and all the physicians have to be retrained to do the documentation sufficient to get uh, reimbursed for uh, our work the ICD-10 instead of ICD-9 uh, classification. So it's been a tremendous educational effort in our institution to get us ready for that, and we're working to get that uh, CME accredited as well. So thank you. This is uh, really uh, a big deal as far as uh, medicine is going to be facing uh, the switch over to ICD-10. And I'm sure the hospital uh, C-suite is very much in tune uh, to that. So the way that uh, uh, the main message could be crafted would be how the CME office is uh, helping the institution make the transition to medicine of the uh, future and changes that are uh, not only here now, but are going to be continued. And so one of the supporting points could be with uh, uh, ICD-10 as just one example of all the many things that uh, the CME office is, uh, uh, is providing. Yes, because the hospital tends, uh, stands to lose tens of millions of dollars in reimbursement if we do that transition in the coding uh, scheme poorly. And so that would be one of those great uh, uh, additional points because you can talk about this, uh, about the money issue, which uh, certainly the hospital administrators are very uh, keen uh, and interested in. Agree. Some other initiatives that uh, uh, you'd like to talk about in the remaining four minutes? Okay, well, if not, uh, I think we've talked about a whole bunch of ideas that, uh, that we could use in our uh, elevator talks. We could talk about uh, patient safety and quality. We can talk about uh, the financial implications as medicine changes, in, specifically in terms of ICD-10, uh, that uh, how the CME office is involved with uh, faculty development and on and on because uh, you all have come up with quite a few different ideas that apply to all of us and these things can be cherry picked and then massaged to fit your particular uh, institution. 
So with that, let me thank you all for your participation. I hope that uh, uh, you've been able to get something out of this and uh, we'll be able to test drive your own uh, elevator speech in the near future. Any final things before we uh, wrap it up and call it a day? Okay, nothing heard. Let me uh, put out a tremendous thanks to uh, uh, Jim for for setting this up and uh, manning the switchboard and uh, troubleshooting all the things as they're uh, going along as they've been happening this afternoon. So, Jim, thank you very much for uh, for making this happen. Oh, not a problem at all. Thank you, John. Thanks, and Alex, let me thank you as well for uh, uh, for all that you've done for the PLCs and. With that, let me say good afternoon to everyone.